the lateral bands we described as nothing more than a thickened edge of the dorsal apparatus, not distinct independently moving tendons at all. Now I've covered colored this radial aspect green and the ulnar aspect blue. Remember this is the left ring finger illustrated here. And the reason this is blue is we're representing the interosseous influence. There would also be an interosseous influence here. I could add some blue there. But the green is the lumbrical influence. So interestingly, the lateral bands have a very strong lumbrical muscle influence radially, but only interosseous ulnarly. There's both lumbrical and interosseous on the radial aspect. But you can see here that the interosseous insertion would be shared and go in multiple directions. So the contribution to the lateral band would be somewhat less. Now the same is true here. The interosseous doesn't just go to the lateral band. This is only part of the influence of the interosseous. But we go back to the concept that none of the parts of the dorsal apparatus can move independently. Although they may carry different amounts of tension, they're working together to create movement. No wonder a minor injury to the dorsum of the finger can wreak havoc with the balance of motion because this entire system is a rather thin flat system that's curving around the dorsum of the finger and sitting directly on the periosteum of the bone. Therefore, any trauma causes it to be readily adherent to the underlying bone. We see here a schematic um, representation of the force of the lateral bands moving out to the terminal tendon insertion. Again, seeing clearly that there's both interosseous and lumbrical contributions here radially and interosseous ulnarly. This is a schematic view of the relationship between the extensor digitorum communis central slip and the lateral bands. In this drawing, the finger is in full extension. We see the lateral bands somewhat lateral but also somewhat dorsal at the PIP joint. And as the finger moves toward flexion, we see that the lateral bands move outward and downward and at the end of finger flexion they're even further outward and further volar. You can see that the angle between the distal uh, ends of the lateral bands prior to their insertion increases during finger flexion. Now keep in mind this is a schematic drawing and we have exaggerated it somewhat to uh, create the ability to see it visually. There is little tension in the lateral band during flexion. Why is that? During finger flexion the lateral band has to move laterally and volarly and if it has tension on it, it would not be able to do that. So during normal finger flexion, there is palmar migration of the lateral band. Now this is confusing because in a boutonniere injury, we know that that's pathological. Those lateral bands move below the axis but the difference is in a boutonniere they stay there. There's no dorsal connection that's been pulled or torn apart. In the normal finger there's connection dorsally and that means the lateral man bands do move volarly but they're able to move back dorsally during finger extension. It's just in the maximum of PIP joint flexion in hook and full flexion when the PIP joint is flexed, those lateral bands are at their most volar position normally. So here we're looking at full finger extension. We're looking at just the beginning of flexion. We can see the imagined tension in the lateral band as flexion begins. Greater flexion now that tension has created migration 
but there can't be too much tension because this has to continue to move. There now is increasing tension centrally because that central slip has to go over the apex of the PIP joint during flexion. So in full flexion near end range, there is less tension on the lateral band because it has dropped volarly at the PIP joint, but there's increased tension centrally because of the need to go over the dorsum of the joint in the maximum flexed position. This is a cross-sectional schematic drawing. This represents the bone. This represents the flexor tendon sheath with the flexor tendons inside. And the green represents the lateral band. This cross-section would be just distal to the PIP joint. Because just distal, you have an overlapping of the triangular ligament fibers and the transverse retinacular ligament that goes all the way around. So normal extension, the transverse retinacular ligament is going over the lateral bands keeping them in place and the triangular ligament which is more distal is also retaining the lateral bands. Then normal flexion occurs. The triangular ligament prevents the lateral bands from going too far. The transverse retinacular ligament doesn't really have much of a um, role during finger flexion. It's during extension and specifically PIP joint hyperextension that the transverse retinacular ligament would prevent excessive motion of the lateral bands. So during normal flexion these retinacular structures help to retain the correct movement of the lateral bands. The central slip is moving distally to allow flexion and the lateral band is moving both laterally and volarly. The movement of the central slip distally is what allows PIP flexion but this lateral and volar movement allows both PIP and DIP flexion.